I'm Monica Mercado, uh, and I'm assistant professor of history uh, at Colgate University in upstate New York, uh, where I'm also affiliated with the university programs in women's studies and uh, museum studies. I trained in a history department where I focused on 19th and 20th century women's history and histories of religion in American culture. Uh, but before graduate school, I started a career in history museums, and so I still consider myself a public historian, which often takes me outside of Catholic history. In recent years, I've done writing, speaking, and teaching about narratives of U.S. women's history that find their ways into monuments and memorials and museum exhibits. So here at Colgate, my appointment is as the historian of North American women and gender in a history department. So I don't have much of a chance to teach classes focused primarily on American religion or Catholic studies. And that makes the ACHA a really important place for me to stay involved with our community of scholars as I work on my research. I often tell my students that you never know uh, where a project is going to lead. So many, many years ago, I wrote an undergraduate BA thesis on female moral reform in New York in the 1830s and 1840s, all those Protestant reform ladies <laughs> evangelizing the working poor and immigrant women. And I wrote about gender and space and religious fervor in antebellum New York City. And I wrote one sentence <laughs> in that undergraduate thesis that said something like, we, what, what did the Catholic women who were the subjects of those visits think? We'll never know. <laughs> but in graduate school, I was taking courses in American religious history. And during my second year, I ended up in a social history colloquium that centered US Catholics. And I realized that I had a lot of questions about Catholic women that perhaps could actually be answered. My current project is an examination of the Catholic Convent Academy in 19th century America and the women and girls who lived and worked and studied and played and prayed there. Uh, these private or select academies for young women, I think, really represented the limits as well as the possibilities of Catholic education uh, a whole century before Catholic women's colleges entered on the scene. Um, and so I'm looking at more than 700 of these academies that educated young Catholic women uh, and some non-Catholics uh, before 1910. Most of them were organized uh, between 1860 and 1900. Uh, so my book project, which is about girlhood in these spaces, um, looks at the ways in which girlhood is a lens um, by which Catholics imagine their status uh, in a nation that sometimes still barely tolerated them. Um, these Catholics are <laughs> considering themselves Americans. They were middle class white men and women and elite Catholics who could afford to send their daughters away uh, to good schools. Uh, it took getting out of, of Catholic sources for a few years. So I wrote a dissertation on lay women's reading practices and Catholic print culture in the 19th century. Um, I didn't realize then exactly how much I was writing about books, reading, and education aimed at young women in particular. But after I earned my PhD, I worked for two years in a position that was housed in Bryn Mawr College's special collections outside of Philadelphia and being in the archives, not of a Catholic place, but of a historically women's institution, right? In five days a week in my job made me realize that I had written a dissertation about Catholic women and gender without spending much time in specifically Catholic women's spaces. So much of my evidence had come from rare book collections housed in large university research collections like Notre Dame and the University of Chicago and the American Antiquarian Society. So as I began to rethink my dissertation as a book, 
I realized that women and girls and women's education, not just the books, were at the center of this project. And I started making trips to the archives of Catholic sisters. So here are a few of these convent academy spaces that I chronicled during my archival travels. The archives travel changed my thinking. So not just the new records of the convent academy that I was reading in the reading room, uh, but the very spaces I was visiting. Many of the archives um, of sisters are located on the grounds of their Catholic women's campuses. And many of those campuses were once convent academies before they were ever colleges, um, academies for young women. So spending all this time immersed in this world of the convent academy, which are, they are remarkably preserved. So I'm showing some images from my travels in Kentucky and New York um, that are really uh, sites that reminded me um, of the power of these sister teachers preparing Catholic young women for Catholic futures. And these travels suggested to me that the elite academy was one of the most significant sites of Catholic culture in 19th century America. And that's what my book is about. This is a photo from my last on-site research trip for this project in October 2019 at the Academy of Mount St. Joseph in Western Kentucky. This, uh, the Ursuline Sisters of St. Joseph and Maple Mount are 130 miles southwest of Louisville, uh, more than an hour's drive from Nashville. They're 25 minutes away from even the closest uh, town or city, Owensboro. And I think that geography is really important. These elite academies were everywhere, offering a boarding school education to paying students whose families consider themselves the better and best Catholics of their community. So in writing about these children of privilege, these kinds of girls are not necessarily representative of the immigrant church that I think dominates 19th century Catholic history. But I think these girls are important markers of Catholic aspiration. They are definitely a market for Catholic consumer culture, and they are the subjects of Catholic writers and reporters from coast to coast. Um, they boarded at these schools. Uh, I call them a sort of world of women. There's Maple Mount's uh, beautiful campus. Um, these very elegantly manicured grounds um, remind us of the explosion of women's education in the 19th century. Um, but this Catholic Academy is a place where these girls shared space with their sister teachers. And I think it sometimes feels like a world or a church apart uh, from the rest of 19th century um, Catholicism. So I'm fascinated by these images of students and teachers in the Academy. Catholic women's history has really heavily focused on the social history of Catholic sisters and other kinds of institutions they built, parochial schools, hospitals, asylums. Um, and I think we've missed the ubiquity of this academy um, and the sort of uh, effective and intellectual worlds that some of these sisters, these very privileged sisters created in their convents um, with their, their boarding students and their day students. And it's a world of women I'm really interested in. Uh, if you look at those photos, those portrait photos, that if you just remove the crucifix or the habit, they don't really look all that Catholic at all. To cite uh, the historian Anne Browdy's foundational work, I still want to contribute to a conversation that reminds us that women's history is American religious history, or maybe more precisely for us, that histories of women, gender, and sexuality are American Catholic history. Um, so years ago, like when I was writing my dissertation, I might have told you that I wanted to focus uh, or get more focus on the histories of Catholic lay women, not just Catholic sisters. But now I hope to urge more scholars of women and gender more broadly, and also historians of childhood and youth uh, to pay attention to American Catholics and to show 
our field, American Catholic history, how significant these elite spaces were to building Catholic culture um, for better or for worse. I also hope in a small way to contribute to an American Catholic studies that is being more careful to point out the shape of whiteness uh, in the 19th century. And so I think some of the most provocative work pushing my own 19th century research along is by scholars writing about the 20th, folks like Shannon D. Williams at Villanova and Matt Kressler at the College of Charleston, whose work on Black Catholics and the racism and white supremacy embedded in Catholic institutions in the United States has made me a more precise thinker about the space of the convent and convent academies in these cities and towns across the US uh, and the way that the academies I study are drawing boundaries of race and class. I think finishing a book can be isolating, much like finishing a dissertation. And now we're almost a year into this global pandemic that has made in-person connection really difficult. And this moment has pushed me back also into interdisciplinary work. So joining networks of colleagues in new virtual writing groups or making new connections to do new kinds of research brainstorming together. So as I contemplate another year without archives travel to start a new project, I also find myself going back to some of my original uh, inspirations, museums and collections work. Um, and so I'm hoping to be part of some new conversations about American Catholic things and material culture studies. Uh, and so I'm working on some pieces about uh, Catholic girls scrapbooks and other Catholic objects, what I'm calling an archive of girlhood. And I'm working with a bunch of folks in religious studies to write about research methods uh, for material religion in the US context and how we increasingly find ourselves acquiring our own collections of religious stuff uh, to do this work, um, both because that's where the stuff is and because we aren't able um, to travel to libraries and archives anymore. 